Well, last week we talked about what it means to be more than a conqueror. We aren't just conquerors, we're more than a conquerors. And one of the definitions that we gave you was the fact that it means you can't even lose. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, nothing can ever separate us. It doesn't matter what we go through in life. And so being more than a conqueror means that you can't even lose. Well, last Sunday night, we had a fellowship here for uh, pastor appreciation, and I'll say more about that at the end of the service, um, just thanking everybody. But uh, while we were over there, one of our guys came up, Dan Richmond, he came up to me and he said, let me tell you one of the best definitions that I ever heard for being more than a conqueror. And so he shared it with me and I thought it was pretty good. And then when I started studying, I was like, oh, that is a perfect way to introduce this message and where we're going today. And so I took that from him and I added a little bit to it to make it come to life a little bit more. So being more than a conqueror or being a conqueror is like a boxer. It's like somebody who spends his whole life training to fight. Okay. So just imagine your favorite Rocky movie. All right. How many of you have seen Rocky? Everybody in here, yeah, pr pretty much everyone's seen Rocky somewhere along the way. At every point in a movie like Rocky or a fighting movie, at every point, there's going to, at some point in that movie, there's going to be like five minutes where there's just music playing and it shows all that training scene, you know? And uh, so I was thinking about Rocky IV. I think that's probably one of the biggest classics out of all the Rockies. And he's over in Russia and he's running through the snow and he's uh, running through frozen streams and stuff like that. He's chopping wood. He's carrying logs. He's pulling sleds through the snow. I mean, he's just grinding, trying to get in shape for the fight. And all the while his, his opponent from Russia is getting like the best conditioning, has the greatest facilities at all. And it's like Rocky's the biggest underdog of all time. And then he goes in and he wins the fight. Yeah, everybody give it up for, no, don't cheer for Rocky here on Sunday morning. But anyway, you understand what I'm saying. If you're going to be a boxer, if you're going to be a fighter, there is a tremendous amount of discipline and training that takes place. And finally, as you work your way through that discipline and as you fight and as you win, you get to the epitome of it all. You get to the championship fight. I mean, there's two guys left in all the world. And at the end of the fight, someone's going to be declared the champion. They're going to be given the championship belt. And for at least a year, they're going to be the heavyweight champion of the world or whatever weight class class they're in, all right? So what happens is, finally, all of that training gets up, pay, pay, all that training pays off. They get in the fight, and as the rounds go on, the training pays off, and one person rises to the top, and maybe they land their knockout blow, or maybe they just survive all 12 rounds, but it's clear by unanimous decision, whatever, whoever the winner is, however you come to that conclusion, when the fight is all said and done, the referee goes over there, grabs the boxer by the arm, raises it up and says, here is your new heavyweight champion of the world or whatever. And everybody goes crazy. That man is a conqueror, right? That man understands what it's like to train and to prepare for the fight. And when it's all said and done, he's victorious. He's a conqueror. Well, at the end of the fight, his wife comes up to him and she's like, great job. I'm so proud of you. You're amazing. I'm so happy. And then she says, by the way, where's the prize money? Hand it over. What you have to understand is the boxer, he's a champion, but his wife, she's more than a conqueror. You understand? Where we're going with this is being more than a conqueror means that you get the reward for winning a fight that you did not have to fight. Let me say that one more time. Being more than a conqueror means you get rewarded for winning a fight that you did not have to fight. And that leads us right to where we're at in Romans chapter 5 and the title of the message this morning, which is this. I'm so blessed. Now, I got to talk about the choir for just a second. That song was on um, the schedule to be sung, but it was like a couple weeks away. But as I was starting to study this message, I was like, this is all about the blessings we have in Christ. So I was like, the title of the message is going to be, I'm so blessed. And then I'm working through the passage and the points start coming. I was like, first point is every day is a good day. And the second point is even on my worst days. And the last point was, you're the reason why. And I texted Vicki. I was like, Vicki, when are we doing that song? And she's like, in two weeks. I was like, how about Sunday? Can we do it Sunday? And she's like, like, oh boy, and she made it happen. Let's give the choir a round of applause. They did a wonderful job with that this morning. And it does fit perfectly with where we're at here in Romans chapter five. Everybody look at verse one, the beginning of verse one and follow along because I'm gonna have you read two words with me, all right? Well, in a minute, I will. It says at the beginning of uh, verse one, therefore being justified by faith, 
based on everything that we've been talking about. I mean, we started at the beginning of Romans with the fact that we are all condemned. And then in spite of our condemnation, Jesus enters the world and he goes to a cross and he dies for us while we were yet sinners. And because of that, by faith in Jesus, when we put our faith in him and what he did for us on the cross, we are justified. We are declared righteous, not based on anything that we have done, but based on who he is and on his righteousness. And so Paul has set all of that up. And now we get to chapter five and he says, therefore, based on everything that we've been talking about, therefore being justified by faith, everybody read those next two words out loud together with me. It says, we have, therefore being justified by faith, we have. Our justification is not simply a guarantee of heaven. And I say that with all the force that you can say that with the fact that we are saved, the fact that we know that we're going to spend all of eternity with God forever in heaven is absolutely astounding. It is absolutely wonderful that in spite of our sins, we're declared righteous and we can enter the presence of God. But it's not only a guarantee of heaven. Being justified by faith is also the source of tremendous blessings that we can enjoy now, that we can enjoy today, that we can enjoy as we go through this life. We truly are people that are blessed if you know the Lord as your, as you, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so let's jump right into that. Y'all ready to dive right into this? All right, point number one, here we go. Every day is a good day. I'm so blessed. Every day is a good day. Go back to verse one. Let's continue to break this apart. It says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. Do you know that the pursuit of peace is a universal human obsession You know that there are people all around the world. There are billions of people in this world on different continents, spread out different um, from different backgrounds, various situations. Do you know that the that the pursuit of peace is a universal human obsession? We're all looking and searching for peace, and why is that? Because we are born into a world that is filled with sin. We're born into a broken world. And Paul's already set up the fact at at how depraved mankind is. I mean, he already told us that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. And if we're honest with ourselves, we find out quickly that we're broken and we're imperfect. I mean, is there anybody in here, the things you want to do, you don't do? And the things that you don't want to do, you do? Am I the only one that finds myself in that situation? We are broken, And because of that, we live in a messed up world. We live in a world filled with sin. And people aren't just pursuing peace in the world and peace on the outside. Ultimately, they're pursuing peace in their hearts. Man, we all know what it's like to be stressed out. We all know what it's like to to fear certain things. We all know what it's like to, to go through suffering and to have turmoil sometimes in our relationships and even in our own home. We are searching for peace. And the harder we try to find peace apart from God, the less peace we experience and the more chaotic the world becomes. You want to wonder why the world is in such a the mess that it's in today? They're looking for peace outside of God and outside of his world. And the more that we search for that and the more that we look to solve our problems ourselves, the only thing that we do is complicate life and we make it a whole lot harder on ourselves. The only hope that we have is to put our faith in Jesus and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And when we do that, we are declared righteous and we are forgiven. So the point that we're starting off with is this. Every day is a good day. You know why every day is a good day? It's because yesterday is forgiven. We have peace with God. The past is in the past. We just got done baptizing this morning. I hope that never gets old to you. Baptism is an awesome picture of the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. But baptism also is symbolic of what happens to us. Every single person that we ever baptize, I'll always stand there and I'll say, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I'm now baptizing my brother or my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I say, buried in the likeness of his death and raised 
in the likeness of his resurrection. And then what's the very last phrase? Everybody out loud if you know it. Walk in newness of life. You understand what we're talking about here? When you find peace with God, everything about your past has been erased. All of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt, all of your suffering, those things that have tormented your mind and have held you back. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, it's completely forgiven. He removes your sins as far as the east is from the west. He declares you righteous and you become a brand new creation. So get up and walk in newness of life. Life because yesterday is forgiven and you are right with God. Can I say that again? You are right with God. If you've been declared righteous, you are right with God. You don't have to get up this morning and live in the failures and faults of the past. You can live in his mercy that is new and fresh every morning because great is his faithfulness. So man, every day is a good day because yesterday is forgiven. But not only that, today is amazing. Today is amazing. How many of you believe that? Has today been an amazing day already? All right, how about any of you here not had such an amazing day? Okay, don't raise your hand, you don't have to, but let me tell you, today is amazing whether it feels it or not. I gotta talk about my dad here for a minute. My dad is celebrating, his church is celebrating 15 years that he's been the pastor. Today, he's been pastor in Kendall Park Baptist Church up in Kendall Park, New Jersey. And uh, they're having a celebration in honor of him and his faithfulness. And he's been 15 years pastor there, but well over 30 years in full-time ministry all together. And so one of the things that they're doing several different videos, one of the things that they're doing is they asked each of his children to just say one word that describes your dad and then just a real brief description as to why. And so we did, everybody was down here for vacation a couple weeks ago and we took time to do that. Well, the first word that came to my mind for my dad was joy. If you were to go up to my dad and ask him, hey, are you having a good day? My dad would tell you something like this. He's a dad, he's a full dad, okay? The dad joke, no, he would tell you something fully like this. He would say, hey, let me tell you, every day is a good day. Some are just gooder than others. That would be what he would say. That's his, I, I'm serious, that's like a typical response. At one point on his answering machine, if you were to call him and it was to go to voicemail, for years and years he had it, he may even still have it today, but you would, it would go to voicemail and you'd hear music playing and then he would come on and he would be like, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And <laughs> that's how his voicemail started right there. Um, when Alana got up to say her word about her father-in-law, she said, when I think of Mike Brown Sr., I think of a lot. <laughs> that's just a daughter-in-law to a father-in-law, you know, he's like, he had a lot of children. My dad has a lot of things to say. But you know, ultimately though, my dad is filled with a lot of joy. And you know why? He never got over the day that he got saved. 22 years of age, after three years of searching the scripture, he put his faith and trust in Jesus and his life was forever changed. Can I tell you, Romans 5 tells us a little bit about what happened. Besides the fact that we have peace with God, you know what you have today? Look at what it says in verse two. It says, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We have access because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We have access. You know what that word access means? It means entrance to the king through the favor of another. There's no way that you and I ourselves could have ever got an audience with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords all on our own. The only way we can enter his presence is because of what his son, Jesus Christ, did for us on the cross. And because of what he did for us, we have access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can I tell you, this is not just a one-time audience with the King. By the way, if you guys had the opportunity to go meet the, the king of England now or whoever it was or some great celebrity, you know what we would do? We would be pulling out our phones. We would be taking selfies. We would be asking somebody else to take a picture and we would share it with all of the world. Man, we would let everybody that we know know who we got to meet or who we got to be in the presence of um, and we would probably never forget that moment. And you know what? That person could care less about who you are. They won't remember it for a second. Can I tell you, 
that because of what Jesus Christ has done, we don't just have a one-time audience with the king. We have permanent access to God. We get to live in the palace. We have been adopted into his family. We don't just go in and out of grace. We stand in his grace. That's what that verse says. We have access into his grace wherein we stand. It is a permanent dwelling. It's not based on how you mess up today or how you fail today. If you have been justified by the blood of Jesus, through faith, you are saved. And today is amazing because you have access to God's amazing grace. Amen. Now, well, let's, before I move on from this, God's grace is amazing, right? We sing about that amazing grace. Hebrews helps us understand what we're talking about here. Chapter four of the book of Hebrews, it tells us that because of Jesus, we can come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know what grace is? Grace is unmerited favor. It's God pouring out blessings on our lives that we do not deserve. And one of the benefits and blessings of grace is, do you know what grace is? Grace is God's omnipotent power to help us even though we don't deserve it. You know why today is amazing? Because you have access into his grace wherein you stand, which means you have access to God's power, which is able to help you face whatever you're gonna face today. And you stand in that grace forever and we absolutely do not deserve it. Is there anybody in here that needs to find grace to help in time of need? I don't know about you, but that's me. I got all kinds of needs, and I know you do as well. Today is amazing because we stand in his grace. But you know how it ends? Tomorrow is even better. Every day is a good day. Yesterday is forgiven. Today is amazing. Tomorrow is even better. Look at how verse 2 ends. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Everybody read that last phrase out loud with me. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know what Christian hope is? Christian hope is a joyful and confident expectation which rests on the promises of God. When we hope in God, we hope with joy and we hope with confidence because it is certain, because it is based on his promises. And if God says it, he is going to do it because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our hope in God is nothing like our hope in the weather. Our hope in the weather is very uncertain. Can I get an amen to that? Anybody know what that's like? Honestly, our hope in anything in this life is very uncertain. We can't depend on it. I was thinking about the weather this morning because this afternoon we have our trunk or treat. And every time we start getting about two or three weeks out from our trunk or treat, when we're talking about it in our meetings and going through the details, the question always comes up, oh man, I hope the weather is going to be good. And then we're like, we'll watch the weather forecast and we'll pay attention to it as it gets closer. Well, another thing that I've learned is in Florida, I have absolutely no hope or expectation in anybody's weather forecast ever because you never know what's going to happen. Even if it's like hours away, the exact opposite sometimes happens than what you think is going to happen. So we don't have a confident expectation in the weather. Praise God, the weather's looking good for today and I'm very thankful for that. Um, but we can't have a whole lot of confident expectation in things like that, can we? But our hope in God is different. It is confident. It is joyful. It is certain. And you know what the object of our hope is? It says that we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The object of our hope is the glory of God. One day, one day, we're going to share in his glory. The past four or five weeks, I've not been able to get away from talking about the glory of God. It just seems like it just, it's showing up all over the place. Um, I asked a couple weeks ago our seniors, like our senior uh, Bible class here, at the school, I asked them about, you know, what is it about creation that when you see it, it causes you to think of the glory of God? A couple Wednesday nights ago, we talked about that here in our Wednesday night Bible study. And uh, man, I just have been dwelling on that. You know, you ever, what, you can just think about it in your head, but what's the certain thing that you see or that you experience that just always causes you to dwell on the glory of God and how majestic it is? I mean, in this area, it's always like the first two things that come up. It's like the beach, 
or the mountains. And both of those things are magnificent. Um, this past week, Alana and I had the opportunity to go to Las Vegas for a couple days, and we spoke to um, a school and church staff out there. We did some leadership training with them um, on Thursday and Friday at Liberty Baptist Church. And Friday and Saturday, we got up a little bit early before the sun completely rose, and we walked out of our hotel, and we took a left. And as soon as we took a left, I was just in awe. I mean, the sky, the, it was just starting to get bright. The sun wasn't even coming up yet, but there was just this red, amazing glow. There was these palm trees, and it was just like, wow. God's amazing. God is glorious. And as we, we walked, we turned, and we started going away from, we started going west, actually, and away from it. And as we're, we're walking up the street, just you could barely even see it because it was still dark. There was the silhouette of these mountains that were just out there in the distance. And I kid you not, it almost looked like a, a portrait. It looked like a painting. It looked like we were walking in a fake place. I just got, again, overwhelmed and amazed by the glory of God. And by the time we made the turn and came back around again, the, the way the sun was shining, it was different, and it was glorious in a different way. And the whole time we're walking and talking, we're just in awe of God and his creation. And then I started thinking about earlier in the week on Monday night, um, we have a tradition every year. We always do chili and we have a fire and we do hot dogs and then the kids paint pumpkins and we just have a family night like that. And so Monday night we did that and all the kids were inside and it was like 10 o'clock and Alana and I were just sitting by the fire and I'm just staring at the fire. And I felt like, even though I was like 10 steps away from my house, I felt like I was just totally gone from everything. I'm just sitting there and it felt like I was in the presence of God. Honestly, that I told her, we started talking about that. I was like, you ever just sit at the fire and it does the same thing that it does when you're, when you're at the beach? I mean, just, it was calming. And it was like the presence of God was just there wrapping you up in his arms. And the reason why I'm sitting here talking to you about that, the heavens declare the glory of God. He's seen in creation. And when you have those moments where you truly are not thinking about yourself or anything that's happening in this world, you're just overcome by his glory. Do you understand that that's what all of eternity, that's what all of life is going to be? Tomorrow is even better because that's what we are hoping in. One day we're rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. One day all of the pain and trouble of this life is going to be gone and we will forever be in his presence with all of the things that that means. Every day is a good day. Yesterday is forgiven. Today is amazing. And tomorrow is even better because we have so much to look forward to. Can I get an amen before we move on? Amen. All right. Secondly, not only is every day a good day. Secondly, I'm so blessed even on my worst days. Even on my worst days. It's almost, I, I love the way the Bible's written. Because I guarantee you, like as you go through a point like that, there's always doubters. There's always skeptics there in every room. And there might even be somebody here this morning that's just sitting there like, man, that sounds almost like it's too good to be true. Or it sounds almost like even a frivolous hope because, yeah, I know that one day it's going to be great, but I'm still living in this life. And I got some problems that are happening. And I got some things that are taking place that are just overwhelming. And even though, yeah, I know that God's grace is amazing, I don't feel that way today because of what's happening and taking place. Paul speaks right into that. And he tells us in verse three, look what he says. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. That word for glory that he uses is the same word that was used for rejoice in chapter two. You know what Paul's telling us to do? He's saying in your tribulations, you need to glory. You need to rejoice. You need to exalt in your tribulations. Now, I don't know about you, but is there anybody in here when something hard comes up in your life, your first response is to, okay, God, I'm going to rejoice in this trial because I know you got something in it. That's not my first response. But that's exactly what Paul's telling us to do in our tribulations. Rejoice. Man, what are we talking about when we're talking about tribulations? We're talking about anything that makes life harder and threatens your faith in the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. Tribulations, anything that makes life harder and threatens your faith in the goodness, wisdom, and power of God. Sometimes it can be little things. 
Sometimes it can be a whole series of little things. Sometimes you could get up and you could get stuck in traffic and that throws your day off. And then by the time you're done getting stuck in traffic, you're getting out of your car and you dump your coffee all over yourself and your whole day is just a wreck. And in those moments, you know what you're not doing? You're not rejoicing in the goodness and wisdom and power of God, are you? You're like, life stinks, it's hard. And then you'll step back and you'll realize compared to other things, really it's not that big of a deal. It could be little things, but ultimately it's the big things. Tribulations. We're talking about a loss of health, talking about disappointments at work. Anybody in here ever have job difficulties? Dan, don't you raise your hand, okay? (laughs) He works here. It's always perfect around here. No, just kidding. (laughs) Yeah, everybody knows what it's like. You work with people. People are imperfect, right? We have difficulties at work. Um, We have strained relationships with family members, sometimes at home in our marriages. You You have accidents. You have natural disasters. You have death. You have people that that have been victims of abuse and all kinds of crazy things. Sometimes you even have um, a trial of your faith, persecution. I I was thinking this week about our new speaker of the house, Mike Johnson. Um, The reason why he's on my mind is I was on Wednesday, I was flying to Las Vegas and we had a three hour flight from Houston to Vegas. And that was when the house was voting and going through all of that stuff. And they had just gotten done and um, the minority leader got up and spoke and then Mike Johnson spoke and then he went outside. And it was, you know what I was watching? I was watching C-SPAN. Give it up for C-SPAN right there. The best quality television right there. Normally you just skip right over C-SPAN, but they were just showing everything that was happening and it was so intriguing. I mean, history was being made. And uh, what really struck my attention was after he got done speaking, they came out on the steps of the, the Capitol there and he started talking and our new speaker of the house started quoting exactly from Romans chapter five, where I'm about to go. Tribulation produces um, ex- uh, patience and patience it produces experience and experience hope. He starts quoting this and I was like, he's quoting Romans 5. I'm preaching on that Sunday. This is, this is amazing. And come to find out um, by all case in point, it seems like he is a genuine Christian, a real man of faith. I don't know him personally, but um, Mark Walker, the man that spoke on our 50th anniversary, the son of our founding pastor, he knows him personally. He's a good friend. He says that he is a genuine man of faith, which is exciting to me that we have someone at that high of a position of authority that knows and trusts in God. But here's the where I'm going with this. I mean, it was an exciting time, but I, Atlanta and I were talking last night. That whole man's world has been turned upside down. I was thinking about his wife and I was thinking about his kids. He has become the center of attention and they are picking apart and mocking and ridiculing his faith. Which means ultimately they're mocking and ridiculing the same things that you and I believe. And I promise you, as exciting as it might be to be in that position, I promise you today, that man woke up with the heaviness of the entire world on him, probably more than he woke up with, wow, I get to do this. No, he woke up with the full realization that he is not fighting against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. He is in the thick of it right now. His family is. And God's allowing them to go through some tribulation. Why? Why is there tribulation in our life? And the answer is this, tribulation leads to maturity. That's what this is all about. Look at verse, at the end of verse three. He says, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Tribulation worketh patience. You know what patience is? It's perseverance, endurance. How many of you, those are your favorite words in the English uh, alphabet, in the English language? perseverance and endurance. Oh, I love when I get to persevere. I love when I get to endure. That's my favorite thing in all the world. Probably not many of us. There are some crazy people though. And they normally end up being like Navy SEALs or something like that. They do love it. How do we find the strength to persevere, endure? Remember what we just got done talking about? We have access into this grace wherein we stand and remember what we said that God's grace is his omnipotent power to help even though we don't deserve it. Let me show you how this, how this works. Paul knows what he's talking about. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about um, the fact that God allowed him to see some incredible revelations. God used Paul in a way that he's not used many other human beings ever in human history. I mean, God spoke to him and gave us his word through divine inspiration. And God allowed Paul to see some, some different visions of of the glory of God, like the way we see the glory of God, I think Paul got even further glimpses of the glory of God. And he says in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, unless I be exalted above measure. What I think he's talking about there is 
unless he gets to the point that, that he's living in this glorious state that he is of no earthly value anymore. He doesn't even know how to relate because of the things that God's allowed him to see. You know what God gave him? A thorn in the flesh. I have no idea what that thorn in the flesh was and there's no point in speculating because God didn't give us any more details because you know why? He wants us all to be able to relate because in one way or another, we all have some sort of suffering or a thorn in the flesh that sticks with us as we go through life. And Paul did what every human being would do. He begged God to take it away three times. He said, God, take this suffering away. Take this pain away. And you know what God did? God came to him and gave him an answer. Look what he says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He said, and he said unto me, this is God, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Wow, that is a testimony right there. You know what tribulation produces? Patience, endurance. And you know what happens when we endure? We are only able to endure when we put our attention on Jesus. And when he says, don't worry about those problems. Don't worry about those things you're stressed out with. Don't worry about the sickness. Don't worry about the health. Fix your eyes on me. I know exactly what's going on. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know all God wants from us? Our weakness. That's it. The only requirement for God's strength is our weakness. I don't know about you, but I got plenty of that. And all God wants me to do is go before him and say, God, I can't do this. I need your help. I need your strength. I need something bigger and greater than me. And God answers because his grace is available and his strength is made perfect in weakness. So tribulation leads to maturity because tribulation worketh patience. Look at verse four. First three words, it says, and patience experience. You know what experience is? It's proven character. It's what you get on the other side of a trial is authentic faith. When you go through a trying of your faith like that, on the other end, it's proven to be real and genuine and authentic. So the patience is producing character. You understand that our English word for uh, for tribulation comes from the Latin word tribulum. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's what I'm gonna go with, tribulum. Go ahead and put that picture up on the screen. Here's a picture of a tribulum. It's a, thres a threshing sledge. On the bottom of this sledge is a lot of either rocks, sharp rocks, or little blades. And you know what this sledge does is it produces pressure. It produces weight on top of the wheat or the grain or whatever it is that it's going through. And as that pressure is applied, so is pain because the sharp stones or the sharp blades start chopping away at that, at that wheat. And what happens is it ends up separating the wheat from the shaft. It starts separating the good from the bad. So when it's all said and done, you have a finished product that is good, that is usable. <laughs> you understand that that's exactly what's happening in our tribulations? God allows the sufferings of this life to produce pressure and often even pain. And as that pain runs over our lives and as we run to Jesus, he begins to separate the good and the bad from our lives and his character, Jesus in us, begins to become revealed. And when it's all said and done, he has something that is usable for his honor and for his glory. That's why Paul's saying, rejoice in your tribulations because tribulation is gonna produce character. It's gonna produce a proven faith. So that way you're not just talking about God but other people see the God that you're talking about in the way that you live your life. And then finally, what he says at the end, he says, and patience experience and experience hope. Man, as you go through the trial, as you have to endure and stay steadfast, and as your character begins to surface and your faith begins to be proven real, when it's all said and done, your experience, your character produces hope hope. You know that God is working. And you know what you hope for? You hope even more for his glory. And verse five explains why. And here's the practical application from all of this. 
glory in your tribulation. That's what he's telling it. Rejoice in your sufferings. Look at verse five. Here's why we should rejoice. He says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Your hope in the glory of God, your hope in the fact that one day you're gonna be in his glory, one day you're gonna be like him, one day you're gonna be transformed. There's no shame in that. You're never gonna be embarrassed by your hope in God's glory because it's going to become a reality. And in the meantime and in the waiting, (laughs) you're not gonna be ashamed and you're not gonna wonder because look what he says at the end of the verse. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. What is the best way to prove that God is real? Through experience, through God being real to you. Nobody's ever going to be able to convince me that God's not real because I've experienced him in a real way. I can't tell you how many promises that I've claimed in my life that God has proven to be true. I can't tell you how many prayers that God has answered along the way. I can't tell you how many times he's forgiven me in spite of my faults and my failures and my imperfections. And I've found that mercy that is new and fresh every morning. I know that God is real because I've experienced it in my life. And when we're going through our sufferings and when we're going through our trials and when we're enduring and when it seems like we're being pressed beyond measure, I can't handle it anymore. God, I can't take it. It's too much. You know what he does? He pours out his love. He shines it on us and he wraps his arms around you and he gives you a peace that passes all understanding and he lets you know that it's okay. I'm still in control and I'm still here and you're never going to lose me. I'm never going to be gone. That's where he wants us to live. Your hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Oh, you will know how real God is as you cling to him in every single area of your life. I promise you, as you go through these things, you'll realize that God is more than, will provide more than enough strength, more than enough peace, more than enough comfort. He'll give you little tastes of joy. He'll give you hope along the way. Moment by moment, day by day, You will make it because it's God and it's the Holy Spirit and it's grace and it's power that is at work in you. And you will experience God in absolutely incredible ways. So what is the point of all this glory and tribulation? (laughs) When we become new creations in Christ, we were talking about that walk in newness of life. One of those newnesses of life that we need to walk in is a different perspective. And I'm not saying that if you get a phone call, and you find out that cancer's back or your world gets turned upside down. I'm not saying that you go and you pick up the pom-poms and you're like, here we go. God's gonna show himself in real ways. It's not, it's not frivolous like that, but there is a sense of as you're processing it and as you're going through it, of just a quiet confidence that God, I didn't ask for this and I don't want this, but I do know that you're gonna be with me every single step of the way. One of the most comforting verses in all the Bible to me is, I think it's Hebrews 12, verse two. And it says, let your life be without covetousness. Now, right there, I got my attention because I'm always wanting something else. It's almost like you're never satisfied in life, right? I mean, did anybody come in here today and just said, I am perfectly, completely satisfied. Could not ask for a single thing more. We might say that sometimes, but then it's like, oh yeah, but by the way, this, and you know, let your life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. But you're thinking, I don't have much. Yeah, you do. For he saith, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have Jesus by faith. If you've put your trust in him, you have him. You have access into his grace whereby you stand. Nobody and nothing can take that from you. The reason why I find so much comfort in that is when I preach passages like this, it starts scaring me to death. At first I'm like, I'm excited. I'm so blessed. I've been singing that song all week. And then I start thinking, oh, but what about the trial and the tribulation? I I really don't want that. I'm just being honest. Like my flesh is, my flesh has a hard time with rejoicing in that. And I start worrying about, well, what if something happens to my family? What if something happens to my wife, my kids? Can I tell you that nobody can ever take Jesus away from me? Nothing in this life is guaranteed. Nothing in this life is certain, but nobody 
can ever take him away. And no matter what I face, I know the truth of God's word is that he will be with me every step of the way. So even on my worst days, I'm a child of God and I have his grace and I am able through his strength and his power to to make it. And here's the conclusion of it all. All right. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. Even on my best days, I'm a child of God. Even on my worst days, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. And you're the reason why. Just in case we think it's too good to be true. Look how Paul ends this passage. Look what he says here in verses six through eight. He says, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Remember when the full realization of your sin hit you and you realize that you were powerless to do anything about it? In that moment, you recognize that Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and that's me. And then he goes on and he says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. For scarcely with difficulty. Think about the best person that you know in all of the world. If they asked you to die for them, you might do it, but it would be with great difficulty, right? There'd have to be a lot of prayer and soul searching. And you might end up putting your life out there for somebody who's righteous, somebody you see value in them, in them being here more than you being here, whatever the case may be. You might die for a righteous man. And then he says, yet peradventure for a good man. Perhaps you would even do it for a good person. Maybe they're not, they're not righteous, they're not at the top top, but they're that next level down. Perhaps somebody would even die for a good man. <laughs> But then he says in verse eight, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't think you start doubting that he's going to shed the love of God abroad in your heart. He's going to turn that spotlight up as the heat of the pressure gets turned up. You don't think that he's really going to turn the spotlight and the pressure of his love up and turn that hose on full speed ahead and blast you with his presence and blast you with his strength and blast you with his peace. Hey, listen, he died for you when you were ungodly. He died for you in your sin. He died for me in my sin. Make no mistake about it. God has proved his love. But not only that, God has much more to give. Look at verse nine. Look at those first three words. Everybody read those first three words out loud with me. What's it say? Much more than. Oh, I love much more. I don't just like a little bit more. Give me much more. Listen, think about it like this. This will will resonate. Christmas day, you open up all your presents and lo and behold, every single thing on your list you got and you are just sitting there in perfect contentment and then all of a sudden, mom and dad come out or whoever it is and they said, hey, guess what? There's much more and you're like, whoa, holy cow, this is amazing. That's what he's saying here. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Are you saved? Saved is a wonderful word. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know for sure if you're saved. Can I tell you, there's nothing like the full assurance of being saved. Saved from your sin. Saved from the penalty of it. Saved from your past. Saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. And the reason that we say that we're saved is what are we saved from? The wrath that is to come. If you start going through life and the pressure and the tribulation starts picking up and maybe you fail a little bit along the way and you start wondering, will I really be saved in the end? Yes, you will because he died for you when you were a sinner. Much more than you can be sure that since he died for you while you're a sinner, that you're gonna be saved from the wrath that is to come. Glory in that. But before I move on, let the reality of that hit. There is wrath to come. There is a judgment day. We will all stand in the presence of God. And we all know people in our lives, if they are not saved, if they have not put their faith in Jesus, they're going to have to experience the wrath of God for all eternity. Much more than we're saved from that wrath. We rejoice in hope because we know that we don't have to worry about that, but we should be motivated to let other people know what we have in Jesus and how blessed we truly are. But it doesn't stop there. Let's look at verse 10. It says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Look at those next two words. What are they? 
much more being reconciled. We shall be saved by his life. Man, go back to Christmas day. You got everything you want. Your parents come out and say much more. And then you process that. And then they come back again and they're like, but there's still more, much more than this is what he's saying. Okay. If you have been saved from the wrath that is to come by his death, how much more than are you going to be saved by his life? buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Our Lord and Savior is not in a grave. He is not dead. He is alive today. He is ruling and reigning. And if he loved you enough to die for you in your sins, then make no mistake about it. In his life, he wants to bless you and he wants to pour out his grace on you. And while we live, yes, we are saved ultimately from the wrath that is to come. But make no mistake about it. You are saved today from the pressures and the trials and the tribulations of life, not that you're not going to experience them, but that fact that the, he is alive and in his life, he's going to pour out that resurrection power that's going to be available to aid you and to help you with whatever it is that we go through in life. Wow. God has much more to give. And if you think you are at your weakest, lowest point today, just get a hold of who Jesus is because there's more to give. And he is alive and he has everything that you need for anything that you're facing. So the bottom line is this, rejoice in God. Rejoice in God. Look at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Every day is a good day. We are blessed. Yesterday is forgiven. Today is amazing. Tomorrow is even better. And yes, even on your worst days, yes, your character is being revealed and the grace of God and his power is available and he will strengthen you and he will enable you. And if you doubt it, God has much more to give you. He saved you from his wrath by his death. How much more is he gonna save you in his life? He is alive and he is ruling and reigning. So there is absolutely no reason for anybody in here to walk out these doors and not to have joy in our hearts. Not joy that's based on our circumstances, but joy that's based in the never-ending truth of who God is. As believers, we should be the most joyful, blessed people in all the world. And our world is in desperate need of some Christians, some believers who live with that type of confidence, who live with that type of faith, who live with a smile on their face, even when it makes no sense to everybody else around them because the rest of this world is desperately searching for peace and hope. And we have all of that in Jesus Christ. Rejoice in God. 